Among the ideas about archaeology that have been very popular for many decades are those that involve claims that voyagers from Europe or the Middle East explored North America long before the 15th century, or even before the well-documented Viking explorations of Greenland and northeastern North America of about a thousand years ago. I plan to address this topic more generally in another video, but today I want to address what might seem to be the most plausible of these theories, namely the idea that Vikings explored the interior of North America well before 1500. The reason this might seem more plausible is that we know that Scandinavians did, in fact, found settlements in Greenland and Newfoundland. So, in principle, it's possible that they also sailed farther south, or perhaps went up the St. Lawrence estuary and managed to get into the Great Lakes, although archaeologists have not found any evidence for any of that. The evidence for these claims mainly consists of inscriptions, apparently in Scandinavian runic characters, allegedly found engraved on large rocks or on stones buried in the ground in places as far inland as Oklahoma and Minnesota. The question is, are these genuine and, and plausible evidence of otherwise undocumented Viking explorations, or are they fraudulent and only evidence of hoaxes? These rune stones have a strong following of believers, and you can find lots of YouTube videos and documentaries on the History Channel and other places that will claim that they are strong evidence for these early explorations. And these claims have had such an impact on the popular imagination that they've even influenced the naming of sports teams. Let's a look at a couple of the more commonly accepted examples to assess their plausibility. If you're ever near Hevener, Oklahoma, you can visit the Hevener Runestone Park. There, you can examine a large flat stone inscribed with eight characters that appear to be in the Elder Futhark Nordic script, except for one letter that's reversed and another that's in the Younger Futhark. Taken at face value, these characters might say something like Gnome Valley or perhaps Gloam's Valley, which some have interpreted as a claim or boundary marker. The Elder Futhark is a script that is very old, and if this inscription is real, it would have to date to something like the 8th or 9th century well before the famous voyage of Leif Erikson. The inscription was first reported in the early 1920s, and a local woman named Gloria Farley made it her life's work to prove the authenticity of this and other alleged evidence for early Viking activity in the North American interior. In some ways, the inscription looks pretty good. Even in the 1920s, the engraving of the letters did not look fresh, suggesting that they'd been carved at least a few decades earlier. And the Elder Futhark ones are pretty accurate in their form, but there are also problems with it that make its authenticity unlikely. One is that its authenticity demands that we accept that Vikings traveled extremely long distances, either around Florida and up the Mississippi River, or through the length of the Great Lakes, and then found a way to get into the upper Mississippi Basin, at a date long before their earliest known attempts to explore the North Atlantic. But there are also problems with the inscription itself. It is not very grammatical. I guess we could attribute this to its carver's limited literacy, but if so, then it would be surprising that the letters themselves are so well formed. A more serious problem is that one letter is backwards, and the second letter comes from the younger Futhark instead of the older Futhark script, which would make it a century or so later in date. There is also no archaeological evidence in the form of artifacts, for example, in Oklahoma or nearby, nearby states like Arkansas, apart from the alleged runestones. It's far more likely that some Scandinavian immigrant who was living in or passed through the area carved the inscription as a kind of hoax. Although Scandinavians were not as numerous as immigrants from other countries in Oklahoma or neighboring Arkansas, census records do show that there were dozens of them within about 100 miles in 1880, 1890, and 1900. Some other alleged Oklahoma runestones are even less convincing, including one that schoolboys found near Poteau in 1967 that has characters that are clearly a copy of those on the Hevener stone. The lengthiest alleged runic inscription is on the Kensington runestone, a fairly large stone slab, about 75 centimeters or 30 inches tall, 
found in rural Douglas County, Minnesota in 1898. The slab's inscription has nine lines of text on one of the slab's broad faces and continues with another three lines on one of the edges. It's now in the Runestone Museum in Alexandria, Minnesota. A possible translation of the text is, eight Geats, or Goths, and 22 Norwegians on an exploration journey from Vinland to the west. We had to camp by two skerries, meaning indigenous people, one day's journey north from this point. We were out to fish one day. After we came back, we found 10 men red with blood and dead. AVM, standing for Ave Virgo Maria, save us from evil. We have 10 men by the sea to look after our ships, 14 days travel from this island, year 1362. Now, this inscription would be considered unusually long, even by the standards of runic inscriptions in Sweden or Norway, which are usually only a few words in length. But the date that ends the inscription makes it truly remarkable, but also provides an important key to determining that the inscription is fake. Like the Hevener stone, this one was found in a part of Minnesota where there was Scan some Scandinavian uh, immigration. In fact, in Minnesota, there was substantial Scandinavian immigration after 1858, with many Swedish and Norwegian settlers after 1867 in particular. The Kensington Stones finder was one Olaf Allman, a Swede who had moved to Minnesota from Halsingland, Sweden, most likely in 1886. Allman claimed that he found the stone buried and face down under the roots of a poplar tree that he was removing to clear land for plowing. Apparently, there were some witnesses to this discovery, and Cleve Van Dyke, a school teacher who excavated at the find site in 1899, recalled that the poplars there were 10 to 12 years old. Some observers estimated their age in 1910 at 30 to 40 years, which would have made them about 18 to 28 years old in 1898. Apparently, no one counted the rings on the tree that was actually above the stone. Experts in Scandinavian languages were quick to denounce the stone as a fraud. In a way, the fact that it includes an explicit date, 1362, makes it a lot easier to debunk, because these experts could easily compare it to what is known of Nordic languages, spelling, and writing of the 14th century. I'll provide links below to this video to ones by experts who can argue the following points a lot better than I can, but the short story is this. On all counts, the inscription fails. First, it includes some words for which there is no evidence in any Scandinavian language prior to the 16th century. And some words, especially loan words from German, that were not current until the 19th century. Second, the inscription lacks the use of the four case endings that would, be, would still have been used in 14th century Scandinavian grammar. Even 15th century texts retain two cases. Third, the inscription fails to use plural verb forms that are to be expected in a 14th century text. These plurals only went out of use in the 19th century. Fourth, the runic characters used in the inscription are a hodgepodge of ones that would have been used in markedly different centuries. Some of them are old Danish runes that should have been out of use well before the 14th century. Others are dotted runes that would have been used much later. In this connection, there is important evidence for the likely source of this mixture of runes, as well as a clue to the likely perpetrator of the hoax. One Edward Larsson, a young journeyman tailor who had come to the Kensington area from Sweden around 1883, has left us his notes, which happen to include this page showing two sets of futharks. The first has 22 runes, and the second, with 27 runes, includes three that represent letters of the modern Swedish alphabet and that did not exist in the 14th century. However, most of the runes on the Kensington stone appear to have been copied from this second set of runes. It's thus possible that Larsen was involved in some way in the making of the Kensington stone. The final nail in the coffin for this inscription is that date, 1362. There are several reasons why no date that looks like this should be on a 14th century runic inscription. First, Swedes and Norwegians of the 14th century did not date their documents with years Anno Domini, like 1362. Instead, they'd say something like 
the 46th year of Magnus Ericsson, referring to the reigning monarch. Second, and most importantly, the 1362 here is in what are called pentadic numerals. These are effectively runic representation of Arabic numerals, and Scandinavians did not start to use, the, use this way to represent numbers until quite late in the 19th century. Normally, they spelled out numbers in words, or sometimes used Roman numerals. Again, I'll provide some links to the topic of pentadic numerals below this video so you can check out that information for yourself. In conclusion, all the alleged rune stones, of which the two I've just discussed are, are just the two most prominent ones, have a number of things in common that point to their being hoaxes. First, they occur in parts of North America where we find no other evidence for Norse activity, while at the same time, places where we do have clear evidence for Scandinavian activity, such as the Arctic and northern Newfoundland, have never yielded any Viking Age inscriptions, while the runic inscriptions from Greenland aren't like these ones at all and mostly occur on objects rather than on large stones or rune stones. Second, they usually occur in places where there was significant Scandinavian immigration during the 19th century. In fact, some of their finders, especially in Minnesota, were Swedes or Norwegians who could have been capable of faking such inscriptions. Even in Oklahoma, where Scandinavian immigrants weren't especially numerous, there were definitely some around. Third, the runes on the stones do not accurately reflect any Scandinavian language of the times they purport to represent. And they often show mixtures of runes that were current in different centuries. Overall, they indicate that their writers knew modern Swedish or Norwegian, but had only imperfect knowledge of early runes or Scandinavian grammar or spelling. Sure, these inscriptions are more convincing than the nonsensical runes I cooked up for the title page for this video, but that's not saying very much. Fourth and finally, in the case of the Kensington Stone, it shows an Anno Domini date that simply would never occur on any authentic runestone. It's also in a numeral system that wasn't used until modern times. It might seem a bit disappointing, from some perspective, that the romantic narrative of brave Scandinavian explorers coming so far into North America simply isn't very plausible. However, it makes more sense to focus our attention on the real exploits and accomplishments of indigenous people in the Mississippi Basin whose efforts are so well supported by genuine archaeological evidence. If you'd like to be informed when I release new videos, please click on the subscribe button down below. Thank you for watching and stay safe. Thank you.